rock and roll is emotional salvation. Mm. It does save our soul. It does replenish our soul. And I witnessed it that very day. And I realized that by doing that and experiencing that, we are better people. We are lifted up and we smile and we make the planet better. And here we are on the Weird Music Podcast with Jay Blakesburg. Jay's an iconic Grateful Dead photographer. Jay, I'm excited to dive into the history of the Grateful Dead, photography, the live music scene, all that. Jay, glad to have you here. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. I was just at uh, Bob Weir and Wolf Brothers at the Greek Theater in Berkeley, California last night. So uh, first show back at the Greek since the pandemic. Uh, iconic Bay Area venue and uh, incredible night of music and good to see all the freaks and the family out again in the world of rock and roll. I had a little bit of taste of it a few weeks ago. I was at the Peach Music Festival also. So I that was my first big dive back into the swimming pool. And uh, it was fun. It was interesting. And, um, you know, people are trying to do their best to, you know, not get sick because it's still a reality. Yeah. Well, as long as we're staying healthy, the water's fine. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's good to be back in. So my first question for you, Jay, as someone, you know, who's been at the epicenter of this jam scene, you know, going back to the Grateful Dead and then even still now, what are some things that you think people from the outside looking in just might not get, might not understand until they would really get involved in music festival culture? Well, first of all, we're impossible to understand because, you know, as Bob Weir said decades and decades ago, um, they are misfits playing for misfits. So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're a weird, weird group of people. So first of all, you know, one thing that was interesting that you said was, um, you know, the jam scene going back to the Grateful Dead. When the Grateful Dead were on tour, up until Jerry Garcia died, essentially there was no jam band community. That word had not been coined yet, jam band, right? That was a word that I believe was coined by Dean Budnick, who is the editor of Relics Magazine. Fish and, 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 and I think maybe Panic both overlapped the last few years of the Grateful Dead. There was no jam band scene. I mean, Fish was a bar band and Widespread was a bar band. Um, you know, they were not really... Um, touring nationally. And if they were, they weren't certainly weren't known nationally. They were known in their little pockets. Uh, so, you know, as far as the Grateful Dead goes, I mean, we were, we were a bunch of people that had tapped into this um, zeitgeist called the Grateful Dead. And no matter when you tapped into it, whether you were, you know, 17 years old in 1967 or 17 year olds in 1987, uh, once you got it and were on the bus, so to speak, um, you were one of us, you know, and, and, and a lot of people were definitely misunderstood by the GP, the general public, uh, you know, they didn't know what to make of us. I mean, I remember going to my, maybe my 25th high school reunion or something like that, or maybe it was even my 35th. I don't even remember. Um, have I hit 35 yet? I think I have. Um, uh, and somebody said to me something like, do you still follow the Grateful Dead? You know, like that's what they remembered of me from high school. You know, I don't even think they knew Jerry Garcia was dead and the Grateful Dead doesn't <laughs> exist. I mean, Dead & Co does. And, you know, there's been further in the dead and Phil and Friends and, you know, Rhythm Devils, you know, et cetera, Rat Dog, et cetera, et cetera. But essentially like, you know, in their mind, what we, me and all these other people have been doing now for 40 years is a completely foreign experience to so many people that, um, you know, have led somewhat cookie cutter lives, you know, I mean, whether that was in their DNA versus the psychedelic DNA that we were born with, uh, you know, they, they prescribe to the birth school work and eventually death formula of life. And I um, subscribe to the birth fun, 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 school, more fun, 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 rock and roll, lose your mind, go crazy, school, 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 maybe stop for a while, more fun, rock and roll, tour, 
uh, maybe some work, maybe not. And then I was lucky to build a career that the work portion is a lot of fun, fun, fun still for me. And hopefully the death part is way, way off. And so, you know, when I, when I lecture in schools and I've done that in high schools and a little bit in some colleges, um, I use that birth school work death analogy and basically say to these students, this is not what you want your life to be, right? Because there is this whole world out there and, uh, you know, Jack Kerouac told us about it in On the Road and Tom Wolfe told us about it in the electric Kool-Aid acid tests. And when we learned the history of the Haight-Ashbury, we realized that there was this entire adventure in front of you in your life. And all you had to do was be a participant mm. and you would have a better, more interesting life. And so for those of us that have tapped into this type of improvisational psychedelic music that don't want a cookie cutter lifestyle, maybe, you know, uh, another, you know, quote from the olden days, you know, um, graduate from college, you know, move to the suburbs, get a house with two, two car garage with 2.3 children and live your life out. You know, uh, we, us deadheads, us jam band fans, essentially we are more adventurous people. And maybe some of that is due to the psychedelics that we've taken. And, um, uh, and maybe it's just, you know, our nature of wanting to be part of an adventure. And, uh, and because of that, we've had all these incredible experiences in our lives. And those experiences inform and de define who we are as people. So back in May of this year, I went and saw my first real outdoor show. And um, it was Dark Star Orchestra down in Santa Cruz. And it was outdoors. And it was a beautiful day. And it was warm. And it was Sunday. And golden sunlight, you know, splintering through the trees and beautiful hippies from Santa Cruz dancing everywhere. And uh, it was just this, you know, incredible experience. And, and what I realized in that moment, while I was watching all of these people, and, and you know, I probably took 1500 photos that day, and 200 of them were of the band and 1300 of them were people dancing, because I was watching this kind of unfold before my eyes and before my lens. And I was realizing that what I've always believed and frequently write when I sign books for people, when they buy books for me, like, you know, rock and roll will save our souls. Rock and roll will save your soul. Hippie chicks will save your soul. Hippie chicks will soothe your soul. And, and what I realized at that moment in Santa Cruz in May of this year, after, you know, 15 months of, of, um, you know, the great pause of 2020, 21, 2020 slash 21, is that rock and roll is emotional salvation. Mm -hmm. It does save our soul. It does replenish our soul. And I witnessed it that very day. And I realized that by doing that and experiencing that, we are better people. We are lifted up and we smile and we make the planet better. And so I think that what people don't, going back to your question, which I'm not sure if I answered or not, um, you know, what do people think of us? They probably think that we're a bunch of drug crazed hippies, some of them. Some of them actually come and tap into it for a second and they think, oh, wow, this is cool, but it's not my lifestyle or not what I'm going to spend my time with or people that dip in and out of that scene they might have other things going on and listen this is you know we just happen to be weirdos that love live music and want to be part of that as much as possible and that's why we do it all the time and our lives are consumed but sometimes i wonder wow you know if i had a normal life like maybe i'd go to the theater more in new york city or in san francisco or maybe i'd go see more art films or maybe i'd go i don't know to more book readings or do you know what I mean? But it's like, I'm like, oh no, look at my schedule. I've got summer camp music festival and lock-in and, and peach festival and dead and co tour and this show at red rocks and that destination weekend with widespread and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm like, well, when do I do all these other things that I always say, wow, maybe someday I'll go do that because we're just consumed with this experience that we love 
and that moves us and makes us happy and makes us connected to other human beings, which is essential for having a rich dynamic life outside of the birth, school, work, death apparatus that many of us and many of our parents were taught should be the way that life goes. And it is not. (laughs) Jay, what are some life lessons maybe you can take us through that you've learned uh, from the years of, you know, being on the bus? Well, the first life lesson is don't sell illegal drugs um, because if you get caught, you might end up in prison like I did. (laughs) And you don't want that to happen. Be kind to as many people as you can. Even if somebody's being mean to you, be kind back to them. Kill them with kindness. It works out better. Be kind and be generous, you know, and just be a good person and, and um, you know, elevate, elevate the scene that you're in and don't drag the scene down. Um, you know, if you're in a bad mood, figure out a way to change your mood, to be in a better mood so that everybody can go along with that ride because the more happiness, it's simple. It's a simple fucking equation. Be a good person, be nice, smile at people, listen to the lyrics of your favorite songs and let them inform your life. You know, let them teach you some lessons um, because those people that are writing those songs are more clever than I am. Jay, what are, what are some of those lyrics that might come to mind that inform your life? Well, I mean, on the Grateful Dead side of things, you know, there's, you know, a, a million of them. I mean, Robert Hunter, um was the master of that you know so of course there's ripple right i mean you know just go and look at ripple um you know but there are also songs that like addicts of my life which you know as you know what when you listen to addicts of my life as a 25 year old kid cam what those song what that song means to you is a very different thing that that means to me at 59 years old right as we get closer to you know towards the end of your life I mean, I'm, you know, knock on wood, I'm here for many, many more decades. Um, But, you know, so these songs take on different meanings when you're 25, when you're 35, when you're 45, when you're 55, when you have no kids, when you have kids, there's a lot of songs. But, you know, I mean, I can remember listening to, you know, Bob Dylan headphones on lying on my bed, black light posters, 1970s, blood on the tracks, you know, that record, or, you know, a song like tangled up in blue or like a rolling stone. And these stories um, that, that these artists tell you in their songs, you know, for me, it was those songs that said, you need to get the fuck out of Clark, New Jersey and, and have, and your life should be an adventure. Right. I listened to those songs and I felt like that. Right. And of course, you know, I mean, there's a million, million things. I mean, Terrapin Station, you know, inspiration, move me brightly, you know, light the song with sense and color, um, you know, eyes of the world, you know, um, sometimes we live no particular way, but our own. I mean, if mercy's a business, I wish it for you. I mean, what a fucking line. Strangers stopping strangers just to shake their hands. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on. And so, yes, these lyrics can teach us something and inform us, but we have to remember that these people are also human and they're, they are mere mortals. They are not gods, but they can um, enrich our lives with words, just like reading a book when you're, you read a great book and your life is enriched by that experience. It's the same thing with lyrics and music and live rock and roll. And we want that in our lives. We want to be able to, um, you know, tap into that zeitgeist and let it consume us and be lost in those words and come out on the other end, a better person. Mm. I can't wait to dive into some of those songs after this call. So, you, so Jay, you bring up the the humanity of of some of these musical creators, you know, championing some of those songs you just mentioned. Let's talk about Jerry for a second. How did Jerry treat and feel about photographers? So, you know, I only had I think five or six like kind of one on one photo shoots with with Garcia, and um, I mean, I shot the band on stage a lot. My impression of Jerry and, and, and most artists of his generation 
that, you know, by the time I was face to face with these guys. So like I first did portraits of Car Carlos Santana in 1989. That was the first time I was like one on one face to face with Carlos. So that's essentially 30 years into uh, or 20 years into his career. Jerry Garcia face to face 87 a little bit, but you know, 91, 92, 93. Um, you know, so he's, you know, almost 30 years into into his thing. Um, and, and all of those artists and artists of that ilk and time period, by the time I got around to photographing them, they've done this thousands of times and they are so over the photo shoot that all they want to do is get the fuck out of there and go have lunch, right? And, and I'll put that in, in contrast to like current bands like Goose and Pigeons and Twiddle who, and Eggy, who are, you know, bands that I've recently have photographed on portraits of all of those bands, right? And, uh, you know, so those guys have been, you know, they've done a lot of photo shoots, but they haven't done thousands. If I'm hired by a record company or a magazine or somebody that wants a magazine cover and they're going to give me 20 minutes, like it is my job to come back with as close to a brilliant photograph as I can possibly muster, because if I don't, why would they hire me again, right? So I've done 10 minute photo shoots with Neil Young. I've done very short photo shoots with Santana, with Garcia, with all of those people. They just wanna get out of there as mm. fast as possible and just, you know, be done with it. So, you know, like pigeons, the first photo shoot that I did with them, it was probably only about an hour and a half long. And it was something that I instigated. You know, I had seen them play at Lock-In and I sent them a couple of photos and we stayed in touch. And I don't think I had a phone number. And then I saw they were coming to San Francisco a few months later and I looked at their schedule. I think they were doing Santa Cruz and San Francisco and there was a day off in between. And so I knew they were gonna either stay in Santa Cruz or come to San Francisco. And I, and I emailed them like a week out and I said, are you guys, are you guys, going to do your day off in the city because if you are i'd love to just do a photo shoot with you like you know my time my location you know we'll do something fun and they were game and we all went out to the to the ocean at sunset and we did these beautiful photographs which have become somewhat iconic you know early photos of you know pigeons sort of pigeons you know at the beginning of them blowing up because they'd already been a band for i think almost 10 years at that point you know something close to that eight ten years um, but, you know, kind of um, toiling in the underground and whatnot. It was right at the beginning of them exploding, which they have now done. And, uh, and I just loved them so much. And I did this photo shoot with them and I probably could have kept them there for eight hours, you know, and they probably would have been happy and would have been like, whatever you want, Jay, whatever you want, you know, we're here for you. You want to drive around the city and do shots at every other corner? We'll, you know, but like, if I said that to Neil Young or Jerry Garcia or something like that, they'd be like, who the fuck are you, dude? Like, no, <laughs> you know? So that's what's kind of has happened, um, you know, as artists. And, 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 I, and I suspect that, you know, it is a different world because of the need and desire for new content all the time. You know, as these bands mature, you know, maybe people don't live all in the same area like they did when they were in college. As they get older and things change, people move and all of a sudden it's like, okay, now we actually can't just say, hey, let's go, you know, noodle around in the garage for a few hours because we don't live 15 minutes or an hour from each other. We live five hours or 10 hours or cross country. So we actually have to make a plan like to get together and write music or record or do a photo shoot. You know, it's not just like, you know, a, a band when you're all hanging out on the front porch because nobody has jobs and you're trying to figure out how to become a rock star. And you're like, hey, let's just go do some photos in the bushes and, you know, on the, on the side of the house or, you know, down by the creek or the railroad tracks or, you know, the rusted out warehouse or whatever. Like, you know, that's that's stuff that happens when a band is young and early and always living together and hanging out together and always around. And as time goes on, people have other commitments. And that's why when you get to somebody like Jerry, who is doing it for, you know, been doing it for 25 years, they want to be fucking in and out. Mm. My next question, Jay, I'd love to hear the story behind your favorite photo you've ever taken. Um, well, that could probably be the one of when my son or my daughter was being born. <laughs> uh, it, it's, it's impossible to, you know, what's my favorite photo there? You know, there, there are too many to count in terms of, um, uh, 
you know, rock and roll photos. I mean, I've taken millions of photographs at this point. I mean, I have many, many favorite photographs of Jerry and Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and Tom Waits and B.B. King and John Lee Hooker and, you know, Fish and, and Widespread and, you know, the list goes on and on. Mo, String Cheese, all those bands, you know. I mean, I have so many favorite photographs that um, it would be impossible, impossible to tell you the story behind any of them. Um, but let's see, I'll tell you a story about Neil Young. How's that? So Neil Young, his manager, his tour manager and his video guy were going to South America and they needed visa photos. Now, Neil Young can't just walk into Walgreens and ask for a visa photo, right? It doesn't really work. So Neil was playing the Bridge School Benefit in the Bay Area, which I shot for 27 of the 30 years they did it. And the manager called me and said, hey, can you come down and do a visa photo of Neil at the Bridge School? And while you're at it, you might as well just do me, Eric and Ben, you know, the, the, the four of them that were going on this trip. And I said, all right. So I set up a little white backdrop. You know, I got on the, the um, State Department website, got all the specs, you know, you can't wear a hat, you can't wear glasses, you have to look straight at the camera, has to be a certain size, has to be a plain background, you know, all these things. And uh, so I did all the other guys and, and Neil hates getting photo shoots done, right? So he came in, he didn't shave that day, he's super scruffy. Um, he comes in, he sits down, he takes his hat off and he's holding it on his lap. And I'm like, you got to look straight ahead. And I'm going click, 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 click. I probably shot for 30 seconds. He's like, okay, Jay, you're done. I'm like, wait, one more with your hat on. Cause I wanted one for me. And he took his hat and he put it on and he looked at me and gave me this, I can't even describe this expression. Right. And, and, and I got one frame. I took one picture and it's like the money shot. It's just like this incredible fucking gnarly photograph portrait of Neil Young that I did in one picture. I follow Peter from Goose. I'm a, I'm a big Goose fan. And um, I know you do this um, touring, almost like um, photo gallery, so to speak. I'm definitely uh, not hip to the details, but I do know about the talk you've given, the you know opinions you have about how live music's changed over the decades, specifically relating to phones. How has live music changed over the years? How has phones changed the concert experience? What are your thoughts on this? Right. So, so to go back to fill in a little bit of the blanks of what you were just bringing up with you, Peter and Goose, about a week ago, two weeks ago, I think the band was in Denver playing another band that I love, Goose. Incredible. They're just blowing up, and I just. They're just so deserving of it. They're so talented. Um, uh, I do do these speaking tours. They are pop-up galleries, but they're it's a it's a it's a ninety-minute slideshow storytelling presentation about my experience photographing the Grateful Dead over this forty-year period. And Peter from Goose and uh, Ben also um, from Goose, uh, the drummer, and and uh, Jeff, and then all the guys from Eggy also another great band from I the love Eggy. Um, came to one of my presentations at uh, the the FTC, the, the warehouse in Fairfield, Connecticut. Back in June of 2021, they came and saw me speak. And one of the things that I talk about when I'm showing photographs of um, deadheads is that the thing that's so unique about my pictures of deadheads dancing and i've done a lot of photos like that again you can go on my instagram and see a lot of this kind of stuff um uh and um and i have a second instagram called retro blakesburg at retro blakesburg and that is one that my daughter curates and the only thing that's on that instagram is just photographs that i shot on film nothing digital mm. so there's a lot of old pictures that i'm talking about now as well deadheads dancing and punk rockers moshing and things like that um, on ret at Retro Blakesburg on Instagram. But uh, um, so when I sh show these photographs and I'm talking about this experience of these people, as I spoke earlier today, having this emotional salvation, really like, you know, being deep into this moment and absorbing everything that's going on around them, the music, the band, the fans, their friends, their lovers, their ex-lovers, you know, whatever it might be. You know, in 1987, and so I ask everybody in the audience when I'm doing this in front of a live audience, I say, so what is unique about these photos? 
And most of the time somebody gets it, you know, yells out, no cell phones. And I say, yes, and you are correct. And so from my perspective as a photographer and me documenting that experience 30 years ago, Deadheads Dancing, Jam Bands, I did a book called Hippie Chick a few years ago. A lot of those photos are in there is that those people at those shows were dancing because they were in the moment. It was organic, it was pure. They were not dancing so that there would be a clip on Instagram or TikTok or whatever the flavor of the month social media channel is. Um, they were not doing it for that reason. They were not doing it so that their friend could get a shot of them so they could prove that they were there or part of that experience. They were just, they were, they were in that experience. They were creating that experience um, organically, not manufactured, right? And I'm not saying that everybody that goes to shows today is manufacturing experiences because believe me, you know, the way that, Peter and Goose and Rick and those guys play music today, they are creating a very, very, um, what I like to call a no risk, no reward situation, right? They're willing to take the audience on a musical ride that could fall on their face, right? You know, it doesn't always work when you're an improvisational band, everything you play doesn't always work um, on the highest level, but the band and the audience are willing to go on that ride with the the band you know no risk no reward in hope in the hope that when it's said and done we've all got to experience and touch the magic right and so when there were no cell phones there was there was no distraction mm from being in that moment. Um, and so going back to Peter, so Peter um, saw me speak and talk about that and he did an Instagram post about it and it was very kind of him. And I'm honored that, I'm, that my words and my story moved him enough to create that little sticker that he made. And then they did a t-shirt of it, like a limited edition t-shirt with a friend of his and uh, it's amazing. I, it, I just think it's cool that, you know, um, it's just like me going to his show and his, his performance inspiring me to take better pictures, to be in that moment, to capture those people in that bliss. You know, uh, my words inspired him to create something and, and, and started like a little bit of a movement there for a, for a, <clears throat> for a hot minute. And obviously, you know about it because you saw it. And, um, you know, and, and you and me didn't know each other, you know, until today. I mean, we've been emailing, but we're, this is our first time face to face. And so now we have that connection through this thing that Peter did. Right. So I just hope that people can kind of take that to heart that, you know, there are professionals out there shooting video and professionals out there taking pictures and you don't have to live your whole show with your, you know, phone up in, in, in your, in the air or, you know, yeah, if you're friend is dancing. Yeah. Take a picture. It's great. It's a moment, you know, but you don't get consumed with that. Be here now, <clears throat> as Ram Das said and wrote, be here now. That's a brilliant message. And it's something that like phones, they're addicting. Like it's one thing to understand, like, yeah, let me get off my phone and enjoy this show. It's another to really do that. Like music, it's this therapy. We're getting unplugged from this technological extremely logistically intense world and you know to have that deep experience of humanity it's it's intimate to go on the ride with the band and if you're scrolling or opening up your camera like it's like you said a complete distraction well there are bands that made you put your phone in a pouch when you walked in in the door and wouldn't let cell phones into a show you know, you, when you walked in the venue, you checked your phone, they put it in a pouch with your name. You got a little card that had an ID. You got your phone back at the end of the night. And, and you know, it's a very difficult thing to police. And it's got, you know, we're all addicted to our phones. I, I am as well. I'm, I'll admit it. I'm, I'm addicted to my phone just like everybody else. Um, but, you know, when I'm at a show, I'm not shooting pictures with my phone typically. 
Uh, I'm shooting with my real camera because I'm documenting that. You know, I put out a book, uh, I briefly mentioned it about seven years ago, six, seven years ago called Hippie Chick, A Tale of Love, Devotion and Surrender. And um, uh, it, it, you can find my books on my website at rockoutbooks.com if you're interested in looking and seeing who I am. Rockoutbooks.com. Right, rockoutbooks.com. And um, you can order signed copies directly from me, et cetera, et cetera. But this, this Hippie Chick book is called Hippie Chick, A Tale of Love, Devotion, and Surrender. And it's about... Um, you know, the love part is how you fall in love with a band or a scene or a jam band or a festival. Um, you fall in love with a lyric, um, uh, you know, uh, whatever it might be, that experience, you know, devotion, traveling long distances to see that band over and over again on a whole tour, getting set lists, collecting memorabilia, buying their music, um, uh, you know, making new friends, being devoted to that community um, and surrender is being there in the moment and not thinking about your husband it's a book about women this is a book about women's experience i'm the photographer but all other but a woman wrote the book okay a woman named edith johnson who's incredible and the text in this book is mind-boggling um and uh um you know so this is from the woman's perspective you're there at the show to recharge your soul recharge your batteries and maybe your husband or your boyfriend is home with the kid or kids or maybe they're just with your parents and you're there with your boyfriend or your spouse um uh you're not thinking about your car payment or your 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 rent or your mortgage or preschool or high school or college or um, or you know anything. You're there in the moment, surrendering to that moment, right? And I think that part of that surrendering, um, when you do it without your cell phone, it makes it more complete for you and it gives you a richer experience. So that sort of ties into the whole hippie chick thing as well. And again, I talk about that when I'm showing photographs of deadheads dancing and other music fans. What parallels do you draw? Can you draw between improvisational music and meditation? There's meditation and then there's mindfulness and the work you do has to be done in a mindful way. Well, of course, comparing mindfulness and what I do when I'm doing that to the improvisation that I'm often photographing, I mean, those sort of go hand in hand. I mean, you know, life is an improvisation, right? I mean, you know, you can't really plan. Yeah, you can make plans. Yeah, I'm going to go to the workout festival, you know, next weekend, or I'm going to go to Red Rocks to see Goose, you know, the first time they headline there, or you know, you can make, or I'm going to go to lock and weekend and I'm going to fly on this day and you can make those plans, but all the stuff in between is still improvisation. You know, like where do you stop for gas on your way to lock in? You know, what hotel are you going to stay in? Oh, you get there and you don't like it. It's your room is gross. So how do you improvise and change your room or change your situation? Or, Oh wait, I'm camping and it just started raining and all my shit is soaking wet and under six inches of water. Cause I camped at the bottom of a little gully you know, and now I'm, uh, you know, everything is wet, my tent, my sleeping bed, you're like, I've got to improvise, what do I do now, right? So, um, you know, we need to be mindful for me, you know, I always remember and understand that me being on stage at a festival or a show like last night, the Greek theater, that is a privilege, it is not a right. Okay, I don't care who anybody is, you know, you, you do not have that right. It is a privilege and you need to be mindful of that. And you need to be mindful of where you're walking, where you're standing, you know, like you don't want to be, you know, a guest even on stage, right? And be standing somewhere where you're visible to the whole crowd and you're sitting there on your cell phone looking at, you know, your, your Instagram feed or whatever, right? Because you don't want to be a distraction, right? Um, you know, as a photographer, you know, my goal is to almost be invisible, but it's impossible for me to be invisible when I'm on stage and moving around. Okay. I mean, yeah, I can wear dark clothes and things like that, but I think one of the secrets to becoming invisible is being there so much that people no longer think about you, right? You're so prevalent that you're invisible. You know, in my case, I think that a lot of bands that I work with or festivals that I work at, people expect me to be on stage. So they're not necessarily, you know, oh, there's Jay. Yeah, whatever. 
Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's not like people are like, oh my God, there's Jay. And then there's a, too much focus on me. I don't want that focus on me. I want that focus on the band. The more prevalent you are in the situation, the more invisible that you can become. And that's, I guess, what I sort of strive for with my mindfulness when I'm shooting a band, whether I'm on stage or even in a dressing room. I'm just trying to be a fly on the wall and just, you know, maybe shoot a little video or capture a little, you know, unique moment like that. And, and uh, um, again, you know, just be kind of be mindful. It's their space and I'm just a visitor. Mm-hmm. Kind of like all of us on planet Earth. We're all just visitors. Be mindful. We've had some photographers on this show, Doug Siegel, Adam Berta. Um, I love just like the art of photography as a thing, freezing moments in time, you know, a memory forever for photographers early on in their career. Just what are some one oh one business advice from Jay Blakesburg that you could offer? I mean, that's a super complicated question because we're in a very, very different world where people consume photographs you know, by the gazillions on Instagram and social media and the World Wide Web and stuff like that. You know, when I was first starting, um, you know, we cut our teeth and we learned how to how to shoot a specific style that would become our own. Um, you know, we wanted to um, we wanted to be you know we wanted to create unique images, um, and there was a, a market for it. There were magazines and print that paid money for photographs. Uh, you know, we use more photographs now than ever before, but we get paid less and less for them, right? And so, you know, I get that question all the time from young photographers, you know, like, how, you know, I want to make a living, you know, I want to have an office, you know, with cool shit on the wall and, and you know, I don't want to live in my parents' basement forever. Um, and so it's easy to make money as a photographer, but it's not easy to make a living as a photographer, right? Um, you know, you're 25 years old, you're at the beginning of your career and whatever you decide you wanna do in your life. I know you're, you do marketing, um, but uh, you know, hopefully you have a, like a, a job with a real paycheck and maybe some benefits. As a freelance photographer, I mean, we're required to have, you know, 10, 20, $30,000 worth of equipment for a job where somebody might be willing to pay you um, you know, $200, right, to shoot something for them. And that's a tough racket, right? So, you know, you can do that when you're, you know, 20, 21, 22, 23 years old, which is what I did. I shot everything I possibly could. I went to every free concert that happened in San Francisco, in the park, wherever, learned how to become a photographer. And eventually you start reaching out to people that pay money for those photographs. And back then it was magazines and record companies. Nowadays it's bands. A lot of bands bring photographers with them on tour. And that's a great opportunity for young photographers. I do know Adam um, uh, Berta. I do not know um, the other guy, Doug Siegel, is that his name? Doug Siegel. Right, I do not know Doug, but Doug, if you're out there, say hi to me next time you see me at a festival or a show, love to chat. Um, but, uh, you know, it's so it's a little bit harder, like, you know, if you're 22 years old and you live in your parents' basement, you can do that. But then when you're 26 and your girlfriend is like, can we move in together and stop living in my, in your parents' basement? And, and uh, right. You understand what I'm saying. And, you know, you're, you're maybe, if you're lucky, you're grossing, you know, 30,000, 25, 30,000, you know, thousand dollars a year. You can't buy a house for that. You can't own a new car with a car payment. You can't, you know, it's, it's, it's so like I say, you can make money, but you've got to figure out how to make a living and you have to value your work and you have to improve your skills and you have to get better. And unfortunately, you know, rock and roll is this weird thing where um, there's a million people out there that are like, you know, give me access. I'll give you pictures for free. Right. And that, you know, it might work for somebody that's not concerned about money. Maybe they're a trust fund kid or, you know, or an, you know, the case of some, let's, we'll call them elder statesman photographers that are like, you know, in their, in their late fifties that aren't necessarily worried about a $200 gig anymore in their life and can go shoot a show for fun because they just want to go and shoot it. Or, you know, in my case, you know, like I'm documenting history and I'm on, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the downward slope. I've already, I've already peaked, you know, like I'm already on the downward slope towards slowing down and, and, you know, I'm not saying that I'm retiring or stopping or quitting, you know, knock on wood, my health stays good and I can keep doing this 
forever, you know, but you know, in five years or in 10 years, can I still be crawling around on my knees on a stage behind a drum riser at, you know, one o'clock in the morning? Like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if you can do that when you're 70 years old. I mean, I'd like to think that I can, um, but uh, you know, as a young photographer, I think you got to be smart about what you do. You got to recognize that you have a big investment in gear and um, you got to value the work that you do and you got to be paid what you're worth. You know, you got to earn a living. You got to be able to, you know, do what you do and, and, and make a living. So you got to be a smart business person as well as a creative photographer. I mean, there's a million other things involved from, you know, m mindfulness and, and etiquette and, and uh, um, you know, keeping your mouth shut when you shouldn't be talking and, you know, just, you know, being a fly on the wall. I mean, there's a million things. Let's say now you were in your, you know, mid to late twenties in 2021. Do you think doing it all over again, you would be a photographer in this day and age, or do you think you would have done it differently? Well, it, it, there's so many variables. It's, you know, mm -hmm. I'd like to think, yes. I mean, I still love photography. I mean, it still turns me on. You know, like when I get back from a show or a portrait session and download that card or look at those pictures on the computer screen and I'm just like, yeah, like it fucking turns me on, right? And so, you know, that's what you want in life is you want to, you want your work, you want there to be passion involved in your work. And where does that passion come from? It comes from inspiration. And where does that inspiration come from? Maybe it comes from the music on stage. Maybe it comes from a photograph of somebody else that you saw. Maybe it comes from taking a picture of some fans raging, you know, in the golden splintered sunlight. I mean, you know, there's all this inspiration. And so I, I like to think that I'm always looking for that inspiration because that um, perpetuates passion, right? And so if I wasn't passionate about what I do or what I'm doing, um, you know, why do it? Right. So I'd like to think that I would still be passionate as a 25 year old kid than the new me. Um, but I don't know if I'd be able to be smart enough of a business person to succeed. It's hard. It's not easy. You know, there's a lot of young kids out there with, with cameras. And I know every one of them would love to be able to make a six figure salary doing what they love, you know? And I don't know if they are or not. And some of them drop out because, and go back to it as a hobby. Some of them lose interest. Some of them get other interests in their lives. Some of them get married and have kids and go live in a bomb shelter, you know, in, in Iowa. Um, you know, I, I don't know. They come and go, but there's always a kid on your heels that's willing to shoot what you're willing to shoot for $1,000 or $2,000 or $5,000 for $5 or $10 or $100. Right. Because they think, but what they don't realize is that, you know, once you're the cheap guy, you're always the cheap guy. Mm. Right. So I'd like to think that I could have still be successful today. And, and, you know, if I was had the same skills and creative ability that I have now. Yes, maybe. I don't know. Hard to say, but I would, you know, certainly love photography enough that I would try. Jay, who are some of the up and coming bands that you're most excited about? Well, I'm a hippie. You can't quit the mob. So I like hippie bands. You know, I, I, I dig a lot of the baby bands. I mean, you know, we were just talking about the works. I haven't seen them in a couple of years. I really dig them. Um, we just haven't crossed paths. You know, I like all the, all the new bands. I mean, I'm a big fan of Twiddle and Pigeons and, you know, love Spafford and, and uh, Aqueous. Love those guys. I think they're super cool and super fun. Um, uh, Dopapod, you know, Karina Reichman, um, you know, Goose, Eggy. Um, I just saw this band called Neighbor that a bunch of people were talking about at Peach Festival. I went and saw them and they were incredible. Um, they're not young guys. They've been around. They're like Berkeley music teachers, professors. They were mind blowing. Mm -hmm. um, saw them on a little stage, only was able to stay because Pigeons was playing. And I missed like the first 20 or 30 minutes of pigeons to see neighbor and it was worth every minute of it Celise, i don't know if she's a new artist she's she was the singer in trey's ghost of the forest band and she played at peach trey jam with her i, I saw that video on youtube like I mean, she insane is, she is insane you know she's not young but she blew my mind you know i mean so in a way she's a new artist for me she played on a small stage 
Um, you know, I will admit that, you know, she was not on my radar until everybody said, oh, Trey's going to sit in. But I'm glad I got there, you know, 45 minutes before Trey sat in. They were behind schedule. So I got to see her play for 30 or 40 minutes without Trey. And I was just like, holy fuck, this woman is incredible. You know, just amazing. So, you know, and, 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 you know, my daughter turns me on to some other stuff. Like I've never seen them, uh, perfume genius, um, very cool stuff that my daughter turned me on to. Um, you know, my son's turned me on to some cool alt rock, but you know, I, 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 I am not actively out there discovering new music outside the jam band world and the bands that I'm discovering in the jam band world is because they're playing at festivals that I'm at or shooting at or going to or whatever um, or hearing buzz about them from other people, whether it's my kids or other friends and fans that are like, Oh my God, you got to check out Eggy, for instance, you know, like they, I started hearing about them and they actually came and saw me speak at the, in Fairfield a couple of years ago and introduced themselves and I didn't hear their music. And then I connected with them in the last month and saw them at peach and shot their whole set and they fucking lived up to it, man. They fucking crushed it. You know, I just, I love, I love, young bands that are just, you know, they're all roots and branches of that original Grateful Dead tree. And it just keeps growing and growing. And, and uh, you know, I love my classic rock bands, but, you know, a band like the Rolling Stones, they're going to play the song the same way every night on the tour, you know, but you go see a band like Goose and it's going to be a different experience every night. And I like that about the rock and roll that, you know, we're turned on by. And um, that's that's my scene. I'm just I'm just an old hippie who likes good groovy, you know, off the charts, improvisational, psychedelic rock and roll. Well, I love your taste. That goes without being said. Jay, my last question for you: What's your favorite Grateful Dead show to go back and listen to? Um, you know, I don't know if I have a favorite show, but if I were to just have to pick one show, I would actually have to pick English Town in 1977, which also was my first Grateful Dead concert. It was Labor Day weekend. I think it's September 3rd, 77, 150,000 people, something like that. 105 degrees in New Jersey, legendary show, peak 77 Grateful Dead. Um, but the he's gone not fade away jam which is i believe 40 minutes long of those two songs every time i listen to it it still raises the hair and gives me goosebumps it's that fucking good there's an incredible eyes of the world you know i love a lot of the peak moment 77 shows from that spring april may tour there's the barton hall show which is you know often described as the greatest grateful dead concert ever i love going back and listening to some of that Fillmore stuff from 67 it's unreal um and i love a lot of the 73 74 stuff it's just really good um uh 76 also a great year 1980 i was on tour with the band that's where i saw the most shows in that year and and, and brent had been in the band for a year at that point and they were on fire. They were breaking out songs they hadn't played in, you know, I think like in 78 and 79, they had played Uncle John's band like one to three times for the entire year. By 1980 with Brent, Uncle John's band, I think they played maybe around 15 times that year. They hadn't played The Wheel in a few years, the end of the Keith and Donna era. The Wheel was 10, 11, 12, 15 times in 1980. China Doll, Comes a Time to Lay Me Down, all these incredible Garcia ballads that they had shelved for a long time were back in rotation. So 1980 was a really special year for me. Uh, and there was a lot of amazing, amazing shows that year. Um, the Uptown Theater in Chicago were great shows. Lewiston, Maine, Labor Day weekend, 9680 was an incredible show. There's no soundboard tapes of it. They, uh, David Lemieux told me that would have been a, a Dick's Picks or a Dave's Picks ages ago, but there's no soundboard of it from Lewiston, Maine on September 6, 1980. It's a great show, but there's only audience tapes of it. Um, so there's a lot of great shows, but I'll, I'll stick with English Town. It was my first show. And I don't remember that he's gone not fade away jam that night because I was 15 years old. I probably knew three or four Grateful Dead songs, but the he's gone not fade away jam is, is next level, next level, fucking mind boggling, brilliant jam in between those two songs. Mm. 
Yeah. Can't wait to check it out. Yeah. Jay it's, Blakesburg. It's a, it's a Dick's Picks. It's a Dick's, I think it's Dick's Picks 15 or 16. So I think it's on Spotify. Easy to find. English down, 9377. <clears throat> I'll pull it up. Jay, man, thank you so much for coming on here, for sharing, you know, all your experiences, all your thoughts in such a genuine, authentic way. Capture of history, you know, bottling up some of the most inspirational moments that, you know, us in the scene that we could have ever hoped to have, you know, been at that show or, you know, seen that set. I mean, he's freezing it in time and there's a whole, there's a whole trail of photographers who followed in your footsteps, inspired by what you do. Um, man, an icon. So glad to have had you on Jay. Thank you so much. So at Jay Blakesburg at Retro Blakesburg, right? Where else can everyone find you? And I know you have some uh, books too. Yeah. So on Facebook, Jay Blakesburg Photography, you know, Instagram at Jay Blakesburg, B L A K E S B E R G at Retro Blakesburg. Um, and then uh, rockoutbooks.com is my website for, for books and things like that. Um, drop me a note, um, say hi on social media, check out what I do. And, um, be inspired by it. Hopefully, you know, I, I look at other people's photographs and young kids and get inspired by those. So hopefully it will inspire you to go out and um, have some sort of groovy experience in the, in the land of jam bands. Well, this has been the weird music podcast. Thank you to Jay Blakesburg. If you're out there and you've listened this far, you know, I hope life's treating you well and, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Cam. I really appreciate your time. Cheers. Appreciate you, Jay. Thank you for listening. Shout out to the sponsor, SEM Tickets. We love y'all. We'll see you real soon.